Hello and welcome to Sound Strategic. I'm Maya Nowens, Senior Fellow for Chinese Defense Policy and Military Modernization. From 28 to 30 June 2022, NATO held its Madrid summit where leaders from allied countries and four Indo-Pacific countries, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, met to discuss the future of the alliance at a critical time for collective security, international peace, and stability. NATO leaders called the summit historic. It took place against the backdrop of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, NATO's assistance to Ukraine, the signing of an accession protocol for Finland and Sweden to join the alliance, and the adoption of the 2022 NATO strategic concept, which set out the vision for the alliance for the next 10 years. But what was new about the Madrid summit and indeed the strategic concept? What did it get right or wrong? And how realistic are the ambitions it outlines for the alliance? I'm joined today by four IISS colleagues to discuss NATO's conventional force and tasks in light of the Ukraine war, the arms control dimension of the strategic concept, defense spending ambitions, and how the alliance seeks to maintain its innovative edge. Dr. Bastian Gigerich is the Director of Defense and Military Analysis at the IISS, Fennel McGurdy is a Senior Fellow for Defense Economics, William Alberk is the Director of Strategy, Technology and Arms Control, and last but not least, Dr. Simona Sore is Research Fellow Defense and Military Analysis. Bastian Fenella, William and Simona, welcome onto the show. So Bastian, why is the Madrid Summit and its new strategic concept historic, and what in particular caught your attention? Well, I would say let's not get carried away just yet. I mean, the, the circumstances are historic, whether the strategic concept proves to be, I think, remains to be seen. And, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about implementation at some point. But, but for me, you know, Russia, which has undermined the Euro-Atlantic security order for some time now, has started a war of aggression against another European country, has turned itself into a serial war criminal, is raining down death and destruction on, on, on civilians and, and Ukrainian soldiers. We have an unprecedented sanctions packet supported by EU and NATO member states and their global friends. We have military assistance packages from that same group for Ukraine, helping Ukraine defend itself in accordance with its right to self-defense under the UN Charter. And we, of course, have Finland and Sweden, two countries that have been EU member states since 1995, but have been militarily non-aligned, now seeking and receiving NATO membership. We have a string of countries that have rediscovered the truth that defense is not a discretionary and optional activity and who are now putting money back into defense. So the Euro-Atlantic security order of old has been appended. That is a moment of historic proportions brought about by aggression and violence coming out of, of Russia. The fact that the new strategic concept exists to me is not historic. Russian aggression has reinvigorated an alliance that was struggling to adapt, in my view, to a changing security environment that was struggling to contain corrosion from within. What caught my eye? Well, I'll, I'll mention two things, uh, threats and tasks. The strategic concept makes it clear that Russia is a dominant threat to NATO. That's a, that's a good and a clear statement. To me, it was a little bit surprising the prominence that terrorism has received in the threat assessment. That's a function of NATO holding on to its 360 degree logic when it comes to assessing threat. And I was surprised that the conversation about China has actually not moved on more than it seems to have at least based on the strategic concept. And on tasks, I think there's a semantic shift here, but I think it's important in how the three core tasks of NATO are being described. Words do matter here. And I think that the three core tasks now are a bit like a triptych, you know, with, with crisis prevention and, and management and cooperative security basically folded onto deterrence and defense under that unifying theme of collective defense. And, and that's actually, to me, it's, a, it's quite a clever mechanism to establish a single purpose without giving up other functions that member states care about. So I would say, yes, the Madrid summit has set a new strategic direction for NATO, that's for sure. Whether it's truly historic, I think that depends on, on implementation. Maybe just to jump in on China really quickly, I was at the NATO public forum in Madrid when the Madrid summit was taking place, and I found it too striking that the language on China hadn't really moved forward, that nothing new had really been encompassed in, in the text itself. And what I found particularly interesting was that on a panel where Australian Prime Minister Albanese and Foreign Secretary from the UK Liz Truss spoke about China, they had two very different takes on how the alliance could actually deal with some of the challenges that uh, China posed. Prime Minister Albanese said that actually the West can't match China, for example, in the BRA dollar for dollar, whereas 
Foreign Secretary Liz Truss said that actually a geoeconomic role for the West is important to counter some of the challenges that China has wielded. So in that sense, I think some room for discussion between allies and partners on how to actually implement. But that leads me to my next question. Is the political ambition set out in the strategic concept realistic, do you think? And what obstacles do you think that NATO allies must overcome to achieve what has been set out? There's a coherence question that you're alluding to with, with regards to China that I think will be a challenge. But I, I would actually point to the Madrid Summer Declaration as an important standard here because it says, and it's worth quoting this, we NATO have set a new baseline for our deterrence and defense posture. NATO will continue to protect our populations and defend every inch of allied territory at all times. Every inch at all times. That's actually quite a commitment. Achieving this, to me, it, it seems to suggest that it will require a significant and coordinated investment in replenishing, in rebuilding hollowed out structures and inventories, in driving up readiness levels to a height that really has not been achieved by NATO, by NATO member states in recent memory, ensuring the industrial capacity and investment in technology to re-equip, modernize, digitize, boosting support, enabling capabilities. These are, these are all things. These are, this, that's a tall order, actually. And, and that's really only achievable if that moment that we now have of political coherence and unity of purpose makes it into the medium and the long term. And that ambition, every inch of allied territory at all times, that's a standard that, that I think we'll, we'll need to watch out for. I mean, you just mentioned the issue of defense industry, industrial capacity, technology replenishment. So I'll hand over to Fenella now. Allies reaffirmed their commitment to spend at least 2% of GDP on defense by 2024. Have we seen a trajectory in defense spending by allies that supports the ambition of 2% GDP spending, um, but also of what Bastian just talked about? The strategic concept did state that NATO would ensure that nations meet commitments under the 2014 Defence Investment Pledge in its entirety to, the, to provide the full range of capabilities. So they're aiming to build on the progress made so far, but also ensuring that any increases are commensurate with the challenges of a more contested security order. So I think that's quite measured language. It's recognising the economic difficulties facing countries so there is that need to ensure that spending reflects the worsening security environment, but does not create new instability by reducing funding elsewhere, creating civil unrest, and kind of exacerbating the problems that we now have. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine on 24th February, there has been a wave of official uplifts to defence budgets across Europe, with at least 15 countries presenting increases to defence but to varying degrees of immediacy and transparency. Announcements span the region. Most recently, the UK has announced that it will look to reach 2.5% of GDP on defence by 2030. But the most significant uplift was obviously Germany, um, announcing that the country would establish a special fund for defence, that it would reach 2% of GDP from now on. Other announcements are more notional. They're not bounded by a time frame, but if they are all enacted as planned, then investment in defence would increase significantly in Europe. This goes back to, to the increases we've seen so far. Back in 2014, the average allocation among NATO members to defence came to 1.3% of GDP. This year it will reach 1.6%, and if governments enact these measures as announced, the average is set to reach 1.8%, nearly one9 by 2030, obviously depending on how economies fare. A lot of these uplifts are being funded from outside the usual budget, though. Countries are increasing their debt levels in order to show response to the threat. And the fact that these announcements come at the end of a period of quite remarkable growth in European spending is really indicative of the shift in the underlying security dynamics. So effectively, what we've seen in Europe is a transition from economic factors determining spending, as we had in the wake of the financial crisis, and then it moved towards more strategic security concerns following Russia's annexation of Crimea, which led to defence spending recovering to pre-financial crisis levels, albeit over the course of a decade. And then it was back to economic drivers in light of the cost of the pandemic fiscal response, but that was very short-lived. We're now straight back to the strategic drivers and the political following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And a note of caution does always need to be raised when countries look to rapidly increase spending. More money does not just translate into military capabilities. It's an enabler only, as we've said in the past. And recent analysis has suggested that countries need to tie increases to the wider economy to look at strategy, defence industry, in order to ensure that the increases aren't wasted. 
So just how challenging is that budgetary crunch considering the impacts of COVID, rising costs of living, um, particularly in Europe, in the UK, for example, inflation, and on top of that, competing priorities for certain governments who are both focused on the Atlantic at the moment, but also potentially also the Indo-Pacific region? Absolutely. The budgetary constraints are significant, and they were before the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. If we were to rewind to the tail end of 2021, I think in recognition of the economic difficulties facing countries, governments were not enacting significant uplifts to defence this year. 2022 budgets that were in place were effectively flat, holding steady um, in order to accommodate for increases needed elsewhere in the economy. So as the after effects of the pandemic created supply chain issues, inflationary concerns, as you say, pressures on defence spending were leading to quite subdued defence budgets. Post-invasion, we now have a detrimental effect on both the security environment and the economic conditions in Europe, which have polar effects on defence spending normally. So it's which overrides which. The UK was one of the countries to actually hold out on implementing increases to defence, arguing that the settlement had already been increased for defence in 2021 and that economic security was the best contribution that the UK could make to regional security. The impact of inflation on defence spending is also feeding its way through defence budgets throughout the region. Even before the war in Ukraine, high rates of inflation in 2021 were actually wiping out real increases in defence spending globally. Rates in the euro area have reached 8% last month. The UK is currently exceeding 9% rates of inflation. So the pressures from outside the defence budget, but also within it, are going to, to amount further and further. Countries like the US and the UK, they've made adjustments to the defence budget to accommodate for inflation. They've set aside funding to cover the cost uplifts. But arguably, these increases that we've seen this year are unsustainable. Interest rates are going to increase. Debt servicing costs will mount up. It will become harder and harder to implement real increases to defence, as indeed elsewhere in the economy, without creating further inflationary pressure and making the problem even worse. Again, that similar note of caution comes in with the strong increases in Europe. Rapid increases without a strategy, without a comprehensive capability plan, risks wastage, which makes it all the more difficult to, to justify increases, particularly as economic concerns begin to bite. If you've just joined us, you're listening to Sound Strategic I May Announce, and I'm joined today by Bastian Gigrich, Simona Sori, William Alberg, and Fenella McGurdy to talk about NATO's Madrid summit and the 2022 strategic concept. We've discussed conventional capabilities where the strategic concept hit the mark, where it might have missed out, and some challenges as well as defense budgetary questions. And I'm moving now on to William to discuss the strategic element of the strategic concept. William, the strategic concept cited the erosion of arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation architecture as negatively impacting strategic stability. Is arms control dead? Well, uh, I don't think it's dead. The strategic concept makes it clear that it's still one of the tools that the alliance uses alongside of deterrence and defense. They also place arms control in the context of strategic stability, which is fairly interesting. The alliance's acknowledgement that the U.S.-Russian negotiations are going to have a big impact on the future. But it is interesting. They do not say that they're going to pursue arms control as a main pillar here. They Instead, in paragraph 32, they've changed the language to say, we're going to pursue all elements of strategic risk reduction, including confidence building and predictability through dialogue, increasing understanding and establishing effectiveness of crisis management and prevention tools. So it sounds like there's really no hope in the short to medium term to pursue what we'd call a traditional arms control agreement, but instead the allies are gonna use risk reduction, crisis management and prevention. So sort of opening the aperture for what qualifies as arms control. Now, there's still a paragraph that lauds the contributions of the NPT, and they also uh, talk about the ongoing effort in the United Nations on defining responsible behaviors in outer space. But that latter thing is, is specifically, this is what I think we're going to be moving towards in NATO arms control, is looking at rules and norms, looking at confidence building measures, looking at transparency, risk reduction, things like the INCSI agreements, the avoidance of hazardous incidents agreements. So more of the practical crisis and conflict management tools rather than any big new arms control initiatives. And that's a major shift from 2010 and, and before when arms control was still very central. And the idea of new agreements was something that seemed really possible. And what were their changes, if any, to NATO's nuclear posture of significance? 
You read the tea leaves here very, very carefully when you're parsing the differences between the uh, NPT. I did a blog on the arms control language where I tried to show the differences. I'm going to do one on the deterrence language too, because this really gets into really looking at the wording with a microscope. And you would say that there's not that big a change in the nuclear language. There's one significant difference uh, as to whether it's going to have any impact on actual nuclear plans or deployments. That's another question. You know, there's always language in here about the fundamental role of the nuclear weapons to preserve peace. Although it's interesting, they've changed from saying that any circumstance which where nuclear weapons might have to be contemplated are extremely remote. That was from 2010. Now they say the circumstances which NATO might have to use nuclear weapons are extremely remote. So they're not even contemplating use anymore. Now they would be more close to uh, contemplating use. But again, these, you know, these are really small things. It's paragraph 30 where we see some real difference. So you have to go back not only to the 2010 strategic concept, but you also go to the communiques. And here I want to talk a little bit about how I think the strategic concept was written. Normally, the strategic concept would be written by the policy planning unit. It would be a very visionary thing. It would come up with new language, and then the allies would negotiate them. I think the Ukraine war actually bounced allies into a much shorter game where they had to throw that away and then go back to recent NATO communiques and build the strategic concept out of that communique language. So if you look at the previous NATO communique from 2021, the big difference here is that now uh, NATO says the alliance is committed to ensuring greater integration and coherence of capabilities and activities across all domains of the spectrum of conflict while reaffirming the unique and distinct role of nuclear deterrence. Previously, they talked about how to increase integration of nuclear and conventional in deterrence, but this says all domains. So this is getting, I think, towards the US concept of integrated deterrence, where it's conventional, it's nuclear, it's outer space, it's uh, integrated air and missile defense, all contributing to deterrence. And this shows that allies are becoming more and more comfortable with deterrence concepts and saying more. Even the volume of words between 2010 and 2022 on nuclear deterrence is much greater. And again, I think it shows a, a better grasp of the underlying concepts and where US policy is going. The strategic concept also pointed for the first time, I think, to China's expanding nuclear arsenal as well. Aside from describing the current context, what can, or in your opinion, should NATO do to respond to these developments? It's interesting. Uh, you mentioned this is the first time in a strategic concept. It's also before 2021, the only mention in a NATO communique of China was uh, in 1964 and 1965 related to their nuclear test. So it is a really big deal for China to be appearing in this way. The Allies mention strategic stability, and they mention it in a context that I think also applies to China. So I think they are thinking that you know they're going to use strategic stability concepts. So strategic stability, which is delivered through deterrence and defense, arms control and disarmament, and meaningful and reciprocal political dialogue. They do also call for greater dialogue from China and greater transparency of China's nuclear program. It's quite significant, but there's not much, I think, agreement on how to address China at large. I think there are big disagreements among the allies on how to treat China, as you mentioned earlier. So I don't think there's an agreed approach yet, but there is agreement that China needs to be more transparent, that China should engage in arms control discussions, and that strategic stability concepts, which previously had only been thought about in US-Russia context, are going to have to be applied to China as well. Moving on to innovation, Simona, the concept also says that we will promote innovation and increase our investments in emerging and disruptive technologies to retain our interoperability and military edge. But you've been arguing for a while, I think, that new technologies have already affected stability in Europe. So could you talk a little bit more about that? I would welcome the fact that uh, language on emerging and disruptive technologies is included in the strategic concept that NATO has released just a couple of weeks ago. I think that it's important to understand that this language reflects a predominant view among the allies with respect to the fact that the erosion of Western technological superiority, I'm referring here to guided munitions in particular, to stealth technologies, and to information and network-centric battle networks has been eroding. And it has been eroding specifically as a result of, of accelerated efforts by, by Russia and China. And this predominant view comes with the assumption that there is an impact, a negative impact on European stability and security more broadly. 
We see this narrative echoed increasingly in the discourse in the U.S. In the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence has been very prominent speaking about this. We've seen just last a week high-level U.S. official warn that that China is accelerating its procurement of weapon systems, including emerging and disruptive technology-based ones. We've also seen this, for instance, in other allies such as France and the United Kingdom, the、uh, defense AI strategy that was released just last week. Also speaks about the fact that Russia and China are prominent challenges when it comes to artificial intelligence. Lastly, we've also seen an increase in the narrative of NATO itself around the importance of emerging and disruptive technologies and the role, the pivotal and transformative role that they play on the battlefield. At the same time, I would say that. The actual influence that we've seen emerging and disruptive technologies play in security and stability in Europe has been supported by limited evidence in practice. For instance, if we take out cyber and drones, which aren't exactly emerging technologies, we have seen less. Evidence of artificial intelligence being used on the battlefield. Although we do presume, for instance, that in Ukraine, the Russian use of ISR and other assets to take out Ukrainian artillery systems is at least partially automated. So we are seeing some incipient efforts. From our enemies to better link sensors and effectors using artificial intelligence, but also to incorporate other emerging and disruptive technologies. I would say the impact at this moment is mostly focused on the perceived investments that we are seeing Russia and China make in emerging and disruptive technologies, and announced projects that these two countries have put forward when it comes to the integration of emerging and disruptive technologies in defense. Is this a case, in terms of how you would frame this, of NATO catching up in the area of innovative and emerging and disruptive technologies, or is this just a case of NATO leveraging the innovation strengths it has amongst its allies already? You would have to link that to how NATO works, right, and separate NATO from how allies think about these things individually.、Uh, one would argue the United States has definitely been at the forefront of this, with investments and strategic thinking linked to artificial intelligence, for instance, in defense systems since the late 2000s. So I would say catching up, perhaps, has been. Prominently featured in the U.S. when it comes to the actual process of thinking through how to develop and integrate artificial intelligence, this has been ongoing for some time. Of course, this doesn't negate the fact that our adversaries, such as Russia and China, have also been involved in similar efforts. And and perhaps you're better placed here to talk about China than I am. But when it comes to Russia, Russia has certainly been looking very closely into the use of artificial intelligence for Military application. It has been claiming, at least publicly, that its battle management networks are now AI enabled at the strategic and operational levels. It has been putting forward into the public domain a number of advanced combat as well as non-combat autonomous military robots. So we do know that they are investing significantly in this.、Uh, Rostec last week just announced that it was progressing with a new generation. Generation of loyal wingman systems that would be mostly destined for for exports, and it would do so using R and D funding that it's its own rather than the Russian government. So we are seeing a lot of efforts from our adversaries to integrate emerging and disruptive technologies in defense. When it comes to NATO, however, I would argue that it's been a process. It's still on a learning curve when it comes to emerging and disruptive technologies. First, because the way NATO works is it linchpins on a couple of、uh, strong allies starting the process. So you would have you would wait for the U.S. and the France's and the U.K.'s of the、uh, alliance to start thinking and developing their strategic thinking around emerging and disruptive technologies, and then based on that, you would start a process within NATO to broaden that conversation. And I think that with the emerging and disruptive technologies roadmap and the establishment. 
establishment of the Defense Innovation Board within NATO, this is exactly the kind of process that we have seen. And we are at the stage where that those processes are now starting to show, to deliver specific structures, to deliver specific plans, and to, to show a number of actions that are being implemented to uh, accelerate innovation within the alliance. So what do you think is an obstacle for NATO to work across the alliance, but also, I suppose, with the private sector on developing emerging and disruptive technologies? So again, here I would separate NATO from the member states. When it comes to the alliance itself, so when we're talking about accelerating the adoption of emerging and disruptive technologies for the NATO integrated command structure, uh, we have a number of instruments in place which are already doing this. For instance, Allied Command Transformation is certainly working on this and has been working on this for the past four years. The uh, NCIA, it's also accelerating accelerated its efforts towards digitalization, the digital transformation of the NATO command structure. And it's working on a digital foundry, uh, which will help the integrated structures to develop and adopt new technologies, specifically digital emerging and disruptive technologies faster. At the same time, when it comes to helping the allies themselves to accelerate their thinking and implementation of adoption plans for emerging and disruptive technologies, then that is being done and pursued through other channels. And of course, the NDPP is one of them. But we also know very well that NATO has recently established uh, two new structures which are dedicated to innovation, which are dedicated to accelerating the adoption of emerging and disruptive technologies, which is, of course, the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, or DIANA, and the NATO Innovation Fund. DIANA and the NIF are certainly a step in the right direction for the alliance, but With respect to our level of ambition, I'm still very much unclear, and I think other analysts are still very much unclear, what is the level of ambition for the alliance collectively with respect to the adoption of emerging and disruptive technologies. Unfortunately, we don't see this in the NATO strategic concept. It is my understanding that second level policy documents will hopefully make that clear. For now, though, the alliance is very much focused on two priorities, which is digital transformation and investing in multi-domain operations. But how Diana plays into these is still very much unclear. The second big challenge that I see with this is that there's an issue with the internal coherence regarding innovation within the alliance, it seems to me right now, where uh, the more military-focused parts of the alliance uh, have a very clear vision and take a very step-by-step, start small and then scale approach to innovation. Whereas the international staff and the emerging security challenges division would actually focus more on the policy side. Those two parts of the alliance don't necessarily have the same processes that they follow or or they emphasize the same priorities in the short and medium term right now when it comes to emerging and disruptive technologies. Thanks, Simona, for your comprehensive answer. To end, I wanted to circle back to the issue of implementation. As we talked about, the strategic concept is more of a vision document. And so I wanted to ask each of you the one thing you'll be watching for in your respective areas with regards to the implementation of some of the ambitions put forward in the strategic concept. So we'll go in reverse order. Simona, you first. Thank you, Maya. I think that uh, my primary areas of focus will be to look forward to what level of ambition the allies collectively settle on in the secondary step to to the implementation of the strategic concept. And I will very much look to see whether the alliance collectively settles on new instruments to fund innovation, apart from the NIF, of course, and clarifications around how uh, NATO Innovation Fund expenditure can be accessed by the private sector and, and academia in pursuit of innovation. The thing that I'm going to be looking at the most closely is the reopening of arms control inspections after the pause from COVID. Right before COVID hit, Armenia sent a notification to all other states in the OSCE that they would not accept any inspection under any arms control regime from Turkey. Ukraine is obviously not going to accept uh, arms control inspections from Russia or Belarus, 
possibly Armenia as well, you could see a cascade which sees the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe collapse. Uh, so that's what I'll be watching very closely is how arms control opens up and whether it's back to business as usual or whether the OSCE itself comes under threat. I think a point that came through from the strategic concept was the need for effective coordination in the aims of the EU and NATO, where there was the need to avoid unnecessary duplications with the increases in defence spending. And I think that coordination is a point that's true throughout NATO. And in light of the constraints mentioned earlier, efficient spending is really key. Wastage is not an option. So the clarity that we've had in terms of protected domestic capabilities is helpful, but transparency is key. So if there is coordination and effective areas of focus among countries, uh, it will be interesting to see whether there are certain areas in which the UN can play a role here, whether in the longer term NATO upgrades its understanding of and the metrics for determining fair burden sharing across countries. So what happens after 2024? Is it possible to develop more comprehensive assessment beyond the 2%, 20% headline metrics? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I think I'll be watching for that moment of peak coherence when unity that we currently see begins to fade a little bit. I have hopes that the... Uh, addition of uh, Finland and Sweden to the roster signifies a bit of a shift of the center of gravity within the European part of NATO. A lot of Central and Eastern European countries, NATO member states, were proven right, unfortunately, in their threat perceptions, as we can see now. So I would hope that that manifests itself in how NATO as a whole now goes about implementation. I have my doubts that that moment will last very long, so I think uh, it'll be It'll be good to see some early progress on perhaps closer coordination on replenishing and re-equipping. And if we can see those those signs, uh, th those would be encouraging. But as I said, I would still assume underneath the unifying edifice of the new strategic concept lurk some enduring differences that might come to the fore uh, before too long, especially if this uh, current war goes on for long. Bastian, Vanilla. William and Simona, thanks for joining me on the show today, and we look forward to watching more of your analysis come out over the next few months about these topics. Thanks again. And thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. You'll find more information on today's topics of discussion, including recent analysis by Bastian, William, Finella, and Simona, in the episode's show notes. For more in-depth analysis, visit the IISS website and follow the IISS on Twitter and LinkedIn. Please do follow, rate, and subscribe to Sound Strategic wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts to keep up to date with all the latest episodes. Thank you and see you next time.